Welcome to another speaker series at um, the Frontier Army Museum. Today we are going to be talking about the long and rich history of the Fort of the Warren Hunt Club. Um, before we get started, I do want to highlight some artifacts we pulled out of our collection. Um, here we actually have a circa 1935 um, cover hame. It has the bronze um, insignia of the Fort Leavenworth Hunt here, and this would go on cover on, the, on the, one of the horses. Um, we also have here the Fort Leavenworth Hunt Staff Manual. This is from 1938-1939. Um, as you can see, it's actually been handwritten in there who owned it, Frederick Gilbert. Um, what's kind of interesting about this is, um, you, when you think it's a manual, you think you know, it would be like a book or something like that. It's actually a set of maps, and if you kind of take a look here, it's kind of hard to see through the light. Um, you can see here, it actually has, oh sure, um, it has uh, the, the drag marks on here. So they have all these sets of maps on here um, to indicate where they would go to um, do the rides and the, the, the drags on there. And so this is an example of one. So afterward, you guys feel free to come up here and take a look at some of the things that we have. And then we also pulled out the circa 1930 um, hunt club coat. And what's kind of interesting is um, Mark and I were talking about it and he was telling me a little bit about the buttons and what each button meant. And he actually said that this one has six buttons and he's never seen that before. And we don't really know much about it. So we're, I might have to do some more digging about it. But what's kind of interesting is um, on here, if you get a close look um, on the buttons, the um, FLH on there is raised. So it's a more, um, intense kind of version of the button be more expensive and then on the back here as well it's a little bit different and i'll turn him around so you can see him the tail coats are a little bit more different so instead of having just the two that you normally see in the code this one has three along with um the gray here so kind of an interesting little person so um that's enough for the artifacts but like i said feel free to come up afterwards and take a look um and now i'm just gonna Send it right over to Mr. Mark French, who's going to jump on in and, and uh, tell us more about it. Thank you, Megan. Um, first uh, bit of, uh, of, of warning label that goes on. I am not a historian. I'm a history enthusiast. Um, and I am a fox hunter. And I've been hunting about as long as Callie's been hunting. Uh, or started about the same time she did. And so uh, I was asked to come and talk a little bit about the Fort Leavenworth hunt. And as I looked uh, through the notes and the pages and a number of, uh, of reference material, I started thinking, well, um, we probably ought to talk a little bit about fox hunting first. And as I looked out here, there are many familiar faces, and there are some that could easily do this uh, as well, if not better uh, than I do, can, uh, hopefully we'll see, uh, about fox hunting. So uh, a little, we're going to talk a little bit about fox hunting. And then we're going to talk about uh, the military hunts that existed in the golden era of military fox hunting. And then that's going to take us into the Fort Leavenworth hunt, which um, exists today because of this legacy of fox hunting in the United States, um, as well as uh, the military fox hunts. So the, the, the thing to start with is um, if this is what your job entails and you do this for a living, uh, the question is, well, what does somebody do for recreation when you do this for work? Well, one thing is, you do this. Um, and so it was um, many viewed fox hunting as a logical extension of a couple of things. Um, cavalry operations with, uh, with the horse, the panache, and the cavalry ride, the charge, etc. cetera, um, a lot uh, likened it to what a fox hunt is in the chase. And so uh, this connection between uh, the excitement and the thrill uh, of the chase and, and, and riding the horse was a logical extension into fox hunting. Those that do it understand that, um, and particularly those that have this need for speed um, and, and ride up close to the hounds uh, get that thrill. And so the other piece of it was, the, the, the rationale was that a lot of uh, aspects of military operations find themselves into the conduct uh, of a fox hunt. And we'll talk a little bit about those uh, in a minute. So uh, we'll get back to the cavalry, but uh, we're going to talk about fox hunting uh, and we're going to just hit the wave tops. So um, hopefully I won't bore some of you in here. This is a picture of the Fort Leavenworth Hounds uh, out in uh, the Flint Hills uh, west of here. Uh, where we, we, we go to hunt um, a couple of times a year. But, uh, so 
So, what exactly is fox hunting? Well, uh, fox hunting, like a military operation, has components and pieces with people with specific jobs and duties. And so we have what we call the hunting staff, which consists of the huntsman, who's kind of like the quarterback in football, or the commander of a tactical unit directing what's going on on the ground. And he or she uh, is assisted with individuals we call whipper ends. And so if you look at this picture right here, right here, you can see a huntsman, and in this individual, and that one, and that one, are whipper ends, and they're assisting the huntsman. In addition to the hunting staff, we have what we call the field <coughs> staff. And we have masters of fox hounds, which facilitate the administration and, uh, and operations of the fox hunt. We have an honorary secretary who does administrative details and a lot of other thankless jobs uh, in terms of trying to keep the membership uh, in order. We have a field secretary who helps. Uh, and in the day, when these pictures, some of these pictures were taken, uh, I don't think they worried about things like cold harmless agreements and liability releases. Uh, but today, it's a very, very big deal. Um, and these individuals help with that. And then we have this group down here. And these individuals are the ones that really are in uh, contact with the members, the people that are following, uh, and they lead the groups to position them such that they can uh, participate and view what's going on uh, with the hounds and the chase. So how does that look when it's out on the ground? It kind of looks like this. We've got the quarry that we chase. Rarely do we catch. Um, a healthy coyote will outrun a fox hound <coughs> out of nine. Uh, so we have uh, the pack of fox hounds, which is a key component of a fox hunt. And then we have the whippers in, again, that assist this individual, the huntsman, and then uh, the members of the field that are following and, and uh, participating in the chase. And this is kind of what it actually looks like. This is the Fort Leavenworth hunt. Uh, here's the huntsman, uh, a former huntsman. She's not, uh, she's going to do the other things. These are our hounds. And actually, there's at least one individual in this room who's in this picture. Um, and there are some others that are still in the hunt today. Uh, this picture's a bit of, this is a history session, right? In any event. So that's what it looks like on the ground. So, a little bit about fox hunting and, and its origins. So, the use, uh, hounds hunt by two means. Uh, by sight and by scent. Foxhounds hunt by scent, and it's called denary or hunting. Hunting with hounds has been around since antiquity. We know that you know the Assyrians, the Egyptians, the Greeks, the Romans all used hounds for hunting. Uh, but it wasn't um, until the Normans, uh, uh, William the Conqueror, took over England that hunting with scenting hounds. Everyone in, in this country thinks of the. Uh, the English foxhound and that image and everything. Well, it didn't start there. It actually started, uh, we believe, on the continent with French hounds, same thing, and they brought it, and then the English foxhound was developed from then. Um, initially, who owned the land in England? Well, the royal family did. Uh, the king did, and whoever he decided to allow. So it wasn't really accessible to many people. Only uh, the very elite uh, had access to the sport and the activity. <coughs> And at that time, it was stag uh, or deer, and then they hunt, and they hunt rabbits. So over time, uh, as towns and villages grew, uh, fox in England became very prevalent, and um, also vermin, and, and they also provided great sport, and over time became the, uh, the quarry of choice. So uh, fox hunt, hunting coming to the United States. Well, um, the first recorded um, pack of foxhounds that came to the United States was brought by uh, an individual by the name of um, Robert Brooke. And he came to uh, the what is now the eastern shore of Del Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia. Uh, and his father uh, was, was landed royalty in England and was given uh, vast acreage in the colonies. And so Robert packed up his family and his eight children, uh, his wife, his servants, horses, and his pack of foxhounds. And so 1650 is the earliest we have record of the first uh, foxhounds coming uh, to the colonies. Very quickly, fox hunting became very, very popular. After all, um, the British subjects in, in the, the colonies 
wanted to emulate what uh, the elite were doing back in England, very popular, uh, very elitist sport. Uh, and only a few uh, were able to, uh, to participate. In early colonial America, uh, the only individuals who could uh, su uh, support a pack of foxhounds were plantation owners, people that had a lot of land and resources, because it was very resource intensive to maintain um, the breeding and uh, the, the sustainment of a pack of foxhounds. Um, so the big plantation owners um, and the average person, or even someone who was successful in business or otherwise, really didn't have access to the sport. Of course, you needed horses as well, other than the ones that pulled your carriage or you rode to work. This all changed uh, in uh, 1766. And the very first uh, subscription hunt uh, was, was uh, the title was the Gloucester Hunt in Philadelphia. And this is the first time a group of individuals who weren't wealthy landowners got together and pooled their resources and their money and paid someone to maintain the, the kennel and the pack of hounds. And these individuals, and I'm sure it was all men at the time, uh, would get together two or three times a week. And they actually hunted across the river in New Jersey um, but uh, the, the club was in Philadelphia. And this hunt actually stayed in existence up, up until the Revolutionary War and then reestablished after the Revolutionary War and up until about the 18, around 1820, 1818, and then it was expanded. Uh, but it was a Gloucester hunt. So the oldest existing fox hunting clubs in North America that uh, are still in existence today. Um, is the Montreal hunt up in Montreal, Canada, and it goes back to 1826. And in the Piedmont Foxhounds in Virginia, which um, goes back to 1840. <clears throat> a lot of individuals um, and key leaders in, uh, in this country were, were at a fox hunt. Probably the most famous is uh, George Washington. Uh, George uh, was a very um, detailed and prolific diarist, and he wrote extensively um, about fox hunting. Uh, George did not grow up fox hunting. Uh, he couldn't afford it. And it wasn't until George became friends with a very famous individual called Lord Fairfax uh, and others, his nephew at uh, the plantation called Belvoir. Maybe some of you are familiar with that. But anyway, George was an excellent uh, horseman and uh, became friends with those individuals who could afford this. And so George worked his way in uh, to fox hunting. And when George um, inherited Mount Vernon from his half-brother, um, then he established his own pack. He kept a pack that was a very prolific breeder of fox hunting <coughs> and was one of the key earliest individuals who were developing what would become the American fox hound. There's um, a lot of lore around George uh, and his fox hunting exploits, uh, but we know from his diaries and others that <coughs> it's not unusual for George to set out in the morning before dark with his hounds, and they would hunt all day and end up on another plantation, spend the night, and start the next day, and they would do this for two or three days at a time. There's a, there's a, a, a popular uh, folklore or, or saying that George fox hunted up until the day before he died, um, that is, that's not true. Um, we know from his diaries that uh, right before he went to New York to take the oath of office as our first president in the late 1880s, um, there are no um, entries about fox hunting after he did that. So George died in December of 1799, and so the last recorded uh, fox hunts were probably in the mid to late 1880s for George. Probably one of the most famous American sportsman was this guy. And he was obviously a big advocate of, 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 of fox hunting. So we're going to move on now to the rise of the military hunt. So hounds, whether they were sight hounds primarily or scent hounds, were with the pioneers from the very, very beginning. They used them for security, they used them to help find food uh, and hunt, um, etc. But packs of foxhounds, particularly foxhounds, but packs were very, very rare. And again, in the early days, only by the very, very wealthy. So as the Western expansion went, the individuals, the pioneers took their hounds with them. Um, 
but the uh, the first early organized fox hunting uh, didn't show up to the end of the 19th century and into the early 20th century. And so uh, I selected uh, a number of these hunts here, and I'll show you why in a minute, as illustrative of the proliferation of fox hunts within the army. Uh, it was very, uh, quite frankly, they had a lot of time on their hands after the campaigns in the plains stopped. There really wasn't a lot to do, except for the Spanish-American War in 1898, and of course World War I and World War II. In between those, they didn't, there wasn't a lot to do, and so they gravitated towards sports. Um, the very first organized military hunt that honor goes, says one of the first, actually the 11th Cavalry School hunt in a place called Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia. And when I was researching this, I didn't even know there was a Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia, and it was in northern Georgia, um, or that the 11th Cavalry was there. But in any event, they organized a fox hunt. And it was a proper fox hunt with the huntsmen and whipper ends and staff. Um, and they were recognized in 1910 by an organization called the National Steeple Chase and Hunt Association, which over time was renamed and became what we know as the Masters of Fox Hounds Association. But that was the original name. And they were, and that was in 1907 that it was established, and so 1910 was the very first. And so they became the model for others. And these individuals were part of the staff, and you can see how they were retired, um, and, and their horses, they don't, they look pretty crossbred to me. Some of you might be able to define better what they are, but they're not, they're not thoroughbred. Crossbreds of some type, probably cavalry horses, horses that were put into service. The next one is the cavalry school hunt, and uh, you can read in the uh, the Junction City newspaper from the 1890s, and it has really interesting details of hunts they went on. And while it wasn't a recognized hunt, they had a pack of foxhounds and an individual. In addition to the, those shown, here was a, a, a fellow by the name of Lieutenant Allen, and we're going to find him here again later on. And so uh, they started in like, 1895. They disbanded for the Spanish-American War and didn't show back up again until the early 1900s, as you see here. Because of the air conditions and other things, a lot of their hounds came from back east and were not used to the air climate. They did a lot of drag hunting where they laid the scent, and then they turned the hounds loose to follow the scent not on a live quarry, but on the scent that was laid. We'll talk more about drag here in a minute. They were recognized by the National Steeplechase and Hunt Association. And then um, these hounds that I'm going to talk about next were brought into the cavalry school hunt. By the way, um, I'll talk about this in a minute. Here's a couple of individuals from this could have been a thoroughbred. This is a picture of the hunt. Um, it became part of the social fabric of the, the, the post. It also, during periods of time, fox hunting was part of the curriculum. So, I mean, think of it, Callie, instead of PE, you had to go fox hunt. Would that be a cool school? But anyway, at some point, these students had to go fox hunt as part of the curriculum. So the Copeland's hunt, this is one of the more interesting uh, military fox hunts. After World War I, the Allied forces um, by treaty, had to oversee the, uh, the armistice and the demilitarization of Germany. Uh, and while they were there, um, the, the head of the U.S. element, this Major Henry T. Allen, who as a lieutenant in 1890 started a hunt at Fort Riley, uh, established this pack in Koblenz, Germany, which was the headquarters for the U.S. forces that were part of the occupation forces. And so in 1920, uh, they established a pack, and this guy right here, if you don't know him, Joseph B. Thomas was uh, a prolific uh, fox hunter and breeder and built a, a facility called Huntland, which is outside Middleburg, Virginia, and you can take tours of it, and it's an estate, and the, uh, the cows are eye-watering, uh, the, the, the stables for the horses, and so Thomas was very, very instrumental in the, um, in the development and the, and the proliferation of the American foxhound. He disdained English hounds. And when you read, uh, it, it's, it's, it's sarcasm and the criticism are driven. But in any event, Thomas was also very, very generous and gave uh, hounds to a lot of different hunts. Um, and so all the staff 
were serving officers in the headquarters. And you read these absolutely wonderful accounts. They hunted primarily stag with the sentry cows, and they had officers from all the Allied forces. Um, unlike today, none of the landowners complained about them riding over their, their country. Um, what were they going to do, right? Um, anyway, so 23, the hunt was disbanded because uh, the U.S. forces went back to the States. They didn't feel that the occupation forces were needed. I mean, what could have gone wrong, right? <laughs> so there's, there, there he is, General Allen, and a very nice looking charger, fox hunter. The next hunt is the artillery hunt. I chose this hunt uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is it, it, it illustrated uh, what was a very common practice, and there were a number of organized hunts um, on, on the installation, on the uh, what became Fort Sill, what is Fort Sill, and uh, they got together and they said, look, we could do much better, and so they combined and they petitioned for registration and recognition with the uh, National Steeplechase and Hunt Association. Um, and, and interesting, there was also an enlisted hunt at this time and that also combined with them. So here's some pictures of some of the individuals that were members of the staff um, in the uh, early 20s. This is kind of an interesting picture for a couple of reasons. Uh, there's a master and, and two, two of the hunting staff, the whipper ends. And as we, we talked about before, or that Megan mentioned, unlike that coat there, which I have my theory on that coat, by the way, of why it looks that way, and maybe I'll share with you. But so if you notice, uh, they each have four buttons. And one's a master and two of them are hunting staff. And that's one way you can denote that. The other thing is what was trendy at the time during that period were the balloon riding bridges. You don't see that very often today. Sometimes uh, you do on occasion. Um, and also, if you notice, the cut of the coat is a little bit different than mine. Uh, and that was the standard look. And those days, no, no harnesses either, uh, which most coats wear today. And here's a picture of the hunt um, coming in after a long day at Fort Sill. So the next one's the infantry school hunt, and it, like Sill and some of the others, um, brought uh, elements together to create a, a functional and very, very popular um, pack. The other thing of note about the infantry school hunt is when the Koblenz hunt pulled in, in Germany, they shipped their hounds back, and they, uh, they took hounds from Riley, which is where the Koblenz hounds went, and came uh, to Fort Benning. I have also seen where Fort Leavenworth Hunt took some of these hounds as well. Unfortunately, and we'll, I'll show you why, the hounds we have are not from this lineage today. This is a very large number. Um, we count hounds in couples, which is pairs, so you double that, and that's a very, very large pack of hounds, and I probably didn't take them all out at once. Uh, but we have about 16 or 17 couples in the Fort Leavenworth Hunt today, and there's a couple of reasons for this. This is also interesting. This is the quarry that they had in Georgia around Fort Benning. A lot of bobcat, gray, and red foxes. So moving on to the key group here. So the Fort Leavenworth Hunt. Uh, this is a, a very interesting and illustrated picture. Uh, this gentleman right here is, at the time, Lieutenant Colonel Paul Davidson. He uh, would be promoted in the, uh, around 1940 to a full colonel. Uh, when he was assigned here, um, permanent party, he came through uh, in the 20s for the, uh, the school. Uh, he was the editor of Military Review and wrote a lot. And a number of us have uh, the books that he wrote, and he's also, I think, responsible for the staff manual that Lieutenant Colonel Galbraith, uh, who was a member of the hunting staff, uh, as well as probably the field staff there, but that shows you the kind of detail. And these individuals are serving officers on either side of him, um, who are members of either the field or the hunting staff. These two men on the end were, are, are cavalry troopers from the 10th Cavalry. Uh, while the 10th Cavalry, perhaps you know, was formed here, Congress uh, established two regiments of colored cavalry and two regiments, infantry regiments in 1866. The 10th Cavalry was formed here at Fort Leavenworth. The 9th Cavalry was formed uh, in New Orleans. Uh, in 1866, and then went on to great exploits in the campaigns across the plains, as well as duty on the border with Pancho Villa, 
uh, the uh, Spanish-American War and other things. Well, the 10th Cav came back to Fort Leavenworth uh, around 1931 uh, as service troops, minus the machine gun troop and one of the squadrons. And they also became very, very important to the fox hunt. And uh, we'll talk more about that as we get into this. Anyway. So, we believe that the Fort Leavenworth <coughs> was established in 1926. Unfortunately, there is no record of it of what occurred in 1926. But we believe that it was established in 26. It may have been two guys in a bar in, in Glenworth uh, saying that we want to hunt. Uh, but we do know that the uh, first recorded organized fox hunt was in 1929. And a major John Daly was the huntsman. And he was a huntsman for a very short period of time. And then we started a very long string of masters and huntsmen. I'll talk about a couple of those in, in, a, minute, in a couple of minutes. And uh, we were registered with the National Steeple Chase and Hunt Association in 29. We became recognized uh, by that organization in 1931, which again is known today as the Masters of Fox Hunt Association. The, the, the 10th Cap soldiers, as I go through the next few slides, you're going to see what an integral part they played in the operation and the ability of this hunt to, to function uh, back in the 1930s. Hunting on, on and off Fort Leavenworth included both drag, where our scent was artificially laid and the hound would find it and then would let make chase, as well as live hunting, both on Fort Leavenworth, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, like all the military hunts, um, World War II uh, took everyone's attention. And so well, most of the officers, minus the ones that were left here for a training base in the school, uh, left, and so there was not enough to sustain uh, the hunt. I'll talk about Davidson here in a minute. Uh, so the hunt closed in 1942 and was reestablished um, with the help of some civilian individuals and as well as military folks in 1965. And our current kennel, which is next to the Rod and Gun Kennel, down the hill from the stables activity, uh, was, was finished in 1965 with the use of prison labor, by the way. So what does that lead us to? That we are, none of the rest, now the artillery hunt um, uh, reestablished for a period of time in the 90s, I think, and they were functional for a period of time, but were not able to sustain themselves. None of the other hunts that I just touched on, and there were others, by the way, that were not recognized. For example, the 1st Cavalry Division had a fox hunt at Fort Bliss for several and there's maps of their uh, their fixtures and their and accounts of, of their hunts. And there were several others, but none of them were organized and or recognized. And so today, the Fort Leavenworth hunt is the only last and remaining military affiliated fox hunt. So I, I could I could have spent the entire time on just this picture uh, for a couple of reasons, and I'll explain to you here as we go. So. Uh, the individuals that are kneeling to the left are local civilians. Uh, these two guys are from Bonner Springs. Uh, his name's Berger and Grace. This guy's from Cameron, Missouri, and his name's Stewart. He looks an awful like the current member, but I, I really am not prepared to make a connection, but you could make that judge for yourself, this guy right here. Does he look like anybody you know? Anyway. But, uh, so, the other three individuals here, these three men are 10th Cavalry uh, troopers. Um, and it's, uh, this guy is um, Corporal Davison, Corporal Black, and Sergeant Stafford is hiding behind the coyote head. The Corporal Black, uh, interestingly enough, I have the book that Colonel Davison described to him and gave to him uh, in 1939. Um, don't ask me how that came about because I'm not sure. But in any event, so this is Colonel Paul Davison here who uh, was a very prolific writer and was um, instrumental in the Fort Leavenworth hunt, kind of hitting the glory days of the military hunt in the 1930s. Um, he was also a master of fox hounds and did not hunt the hounds. Uh, the 10th Cavalry, the Kettle Huntsman, hunted the hounds. Uh, and so these are some of the fox hounds which probably came some from the French lineage, some from the, the, the Dr. Thomas lineage, um, and also uh, with English uh, and also from other hunts back east. Now, Davison, interestingly enough, some of you might know this, uh, his son, who doesn't show up in any of his books or pictures, his daughter Molly does, 
His son, Michael Davidson, was off at West Point uh, around 1940. He went off as a second lieutenant uh, into World War II, but he didn't show up in any of these books or pictures. Michael Davidson went, rose to be a four-star general and uh, the user commander before he retired. Michael, his son, his son, Michael S. Davidson Jr., was my first battalion commander when I was a second lieutenant in Germany. So three degrees of separation. This guy right here, um, most of you know who he is, but you probably don't know his name. I know some of you. But anyway, his name's Hank Reed. And here, Major Hank Reed, 10th Cavalry uh, uh, officer, cavalryman, uh, went on uh, to serve in World War II in Patton's 3rd Army, commanding the 2nd Armored Cavalry Regiment. So how many of you heard of the Lippenzoners? You know the story about the Lippenzoners being saved? Well, it wasn't Patton, it was this guy right here. It was Colonel Hank Reed and his cavalry regiment that went and secured them before they became soup uh, for, uh, for the Soviets who were advancing on them. So this, this picture um, was taken in front of there was a house for the 10th Cavalry uh, Trooper, NCO, uh, who lived there and was in charge of the kennel and was also the kennel huntsman. He hunted the hounds for the, uh, for the hunt. And behind it is the kennel, so we're going to talk about that just for a minute. Here's a diagram. Some of you may have seen this uh, of the kennel. And so that picture was taken right in front of this building right here. And so in those days, there was no Karina. Uh, you didn't go to Tractor Supply or, or uh, Canvas Country Store to get your dog food. They had to, everything was made from scratch with horse flesh or, or cow flesh and other ingredients. And so every meal was, was, uh, was cooked and created here. And so there was even a set of quarters for another gentleman who lived here. And these were the lodges. This is a very large facility. I'm going to show you a picture in just a second. And uh, there are counts of upwards to uh, between 30 and 40 couple of hounds were maintained in this facility. It's a very, very large facility. Remember, today we have, what, 17 couple of hounds in our panel, and they had between 30 and 40 couple in, in, this, in this panel. And there's a picture uh, of it. And again, that picture of uh, the hounds and the coyote and Davidson and the three cat troopers and the men from, uh, from Bonner Springs. And there's the cookhouse. Uh, and there's the lodge, and there's the lodges, and then these radiant runs. Now, anybody know where this was? No guesses? You know where it is. So, everybody know where Munson is, right? You know the neck, the, the network controls building across the street. And then on the corners, there's that electrical substation where Grand Avenue starts to make that 90 degree bend to the west gate. And then there's a one small section of uh, housing, a street that's in there. We all know what I'm talking about. Nobody knows. Some of you do. You know, get some nods. But anyway, that's where I was. Hancock is right here. Okay? Hancock, and so where Hancock comes, so <laughs> Munson's here, the next over here, and that one road of family housing is right up and through here, and that's where the kennel was. Anyway, by 1950, this was all going on. Shortly afterwards, I see mass into the 50s. This building was still there, and by the 1950s, all this was gone. Remember, the hunt didn't be established in 65. So, um, maybe I told you a little bit, you got a blown up map, and in Colonel Galbraith's uh, directory there, um, this is very precise. I mean, they, they had multiple routes, and I'm going to show you a couple of these. But let me orient you for a second here. So this, is, this is from the late 1930s. So there's the U.S. military prison, the big prison outside of Post right there. And so this is Metropolitan Avenue, that Santa Fe Trail. You notice something? There is no bridge. The Centennial, that blue bridge didn't go until the 1960s. So Metropolitan went down to 4th Street, um, or rather 7th, and then went south. It didn't go to the river. And so that was probably an early waterworks. There's the old disciplinary barracks. You notice there's the National Cemetery. It was only in that southeast corner. The house and the flagpole are right there. And the kennels were right there. And so they were so prescriptive. And you notice, and there's the two lakes, and 
and there's the golf course. So they hunted between the lakes and the front gate. And they, they would lay the drag line, so there's, there's route number one, and they would lay the line and follow it, and then they would collect the hounds and go on route two, and then three. And today, of course, the new uh, disciplinary barracks is up in this northwest corner, and then the uh, maintenance facilities for the, the uh, uh, MP brigade are over here. And by, by the way, when they built those two facilities, we stopped hunting on the coast, which was 2004. Ish, close enough. So here's here's another plan route. This is Hunt Force India, um, and again, very prescribed. So they would call the play, say, hey, we're gonna do India, and then they would lay the routes, and then they would go and hunt. This one's interesting because again, remember they hunted uh, drag and live on Fort Lemon Hunt. We did up until 2004, and so you can see these routes. There's the Hunt Lodge right there. Uh, which you, most of you are familiar with. And you can see these routes, and then they hunted all down on the peninsula down. This was all floodplain there. You can, up there, they fly hunted all down through here. Pretty interesting. So, <laughs> this is a picture from, I don't know if it's the end of a hunt or whatever, but this is Colonel Davidson on his favorite uh, fox hunter. And if you look closely, there's a lot of really interesting, there's a, there's a young fox hunter there um, there are no hard hats. I know maybe there's a bowler there, but you've got Stetsons and floppy hats. I particularly like this one. Most of us are familiar with fox hunters that really like to do this as opposed to follow the field master. Uh, but anyway, so you can see them coming through and getting ready to take the fence, and Davis is on a fence as well. And this is from the late 1930s. This, this picture is also a very iconic picture because it tells um, a number of things about the, how the Fort Leavenworth hunt was an integral part of the social fabric of the Fort Leavenworth uh, society during the 1930s up until 42. This picture, this is Salt Creek Valley uh, looking to the northwest. That's probably Missouri right over here and the river's right over through here. But most of you, uh, those of you that hunted on post would know this because we hunted up through here. And this is all overgrown now. And the road up there, uh, up that ridge where it makes that bend in the water tank. And this is the vicinity. So you've got the huntsmen, and here's the hounds, here's the river in, here's the field. And again, some of them are in, you know, felt hats. Some are in hunting attire. But the interesting piece is it was regular practice for members of uh, families on the fort to go out and follow the fox hunt in horse-drawn carriages. Many of these carriages are in this museum now, and you can go back there and see them. And they would follow the hunt, and we call it hilltopping today, where they would go from a, a point of uh, vantage where they could see the hounds working or the, the riders following the hounds as they picked up the scent and would, would, would chase. So it's a very, very cool picture. And again, um, most of you know where that is, those of you from here. This is another kind of iconic picture that tells the story of the 10th Cavalry uh, troopers and the hunt. This is a Sergeant Harris of the 10th Cavalry, and he had uh, an activity, and they called this a pork chop club. And um, I know, no boots, no hard hats, nothing so, he's got, don't go, don't go, don't go. But anyway, he, after school, he would come by with ponies and police up um, children, uh, the officers on post, and he would ride, and they would ride around, and it was a recreational activity, but uh, it also probably got him out of stable duties as well. Uh, but it was a very popular activity, and something that, that uh, reoccurs in a lot of the literature about the Fort Leavenworth Hunt and their relationship with the Defense Cavalry Troopers. Um, this is the Fort Leavenworth Hunt Band Wagon uh, and uh, the, the team of mules. And so holidays, Christmas parades on post, parades in Leavenworth uh, at the time, and I think it's still true. The uh, Veterans Day Parade in Leavenworth is the largest Veterans Day Parade west of the Mississippi. But this wagon always came out and the band played and they went around post. This wagon is still in existence. Uh, there's an individual in this room, I know, that when she was one of the masters of foxhounds, tried to get the museum to take it. Um, for perspective, 
that wagon would probably take up from that display case to this wall. And so for understanding, I mean, and the cop here, it's massive. Uh, it's in a warehouse next to the stables, and uh, it's still in existence, but it's in a warehouse undercover. Needs some repair, uh, but it's but it's still there. Um, but it was to this coat, Meg and I were talking about it. My guess is, when I first saw this, uh, is I wonder if this coat didn't belong to the band leader. Um, I, it's difficult to see a master or a husband wear that, but it's possible. It's just, it's just too out of context to, it, it's too far out for it to be, but it could have been. Somebody could have fancied himself and had that made, but there's no label. Maybe look for a label inside. There is no bespoke uh, tailor tag or anything inside of it. This is also a very famous picture for Fort Leavenworth Fox Hunters and for 10th Cavalry. Uh, we believe that this individual right here is Lieutenant Colonel Jonathan Wainwright, who was assigned to Fort Leavenworth around 1931. Skinny Wainwright, as his nickname, was a cavalryman, um, and uh, contemporary of Patton and a number of others, uh, Truscott and others who were cavalry officers at the time. And he was also a very, very avid fox hunter. So this is the Fort Leavenworth hunt around 1931 or 2-ish, we think. And here's our hounds. And if you look over here, these are 10th Cavalry uh, Regiment troopers uh, who are riding out with the hunt. And there's someone in a bowler, and there's someone in a proper hunt cap. And you can see by the, uh, the models and the age of the cars, kind of sets the time frame for it. Anybody know who this is? Anybody recognize that? I guarantee everybody in this room is driven by that point, some of you hundreds, maybe even a thousand times. That looks familiar. So here's the two lakes. There's a lake here and a lake here. This is where TRAC is, the Trade Act Analysis Center. That was also the barracks for the 10th Cap Troopers during the 30s when they were assigned to the post. Anyway, that tree is that tree. for a couple of reasons. Anybody recognize anybody in this picture? Who do you recognize? John Wayne. Anybody else? So, yes, this is John Wayne. This is Colonel Paul Davison of the 10th Cavalry and, and also one of the masters of the Fort Leavenworth Hunt. And this is his daughter, Molly. And you can see Paul's not real pleased with this individual, who is Walter Pigeon, uh, who was a kind of a heartthrob of uh, the, the silver screen. And uh, this lady also uh, was in the movie. We thought this might be uh, Davidson's wife, but it's not. Um, I'm pretty sure it's uh, Claire Trevor, who starred in the movie Dark Command, which is loosely uh, about uh, Quantrell's raid. He was a Confederate uh, raider who came into Kansas, burned warrants and retribution for all the back and forth across the border uh, that precipitated the Civil War. But in any event, so they were here to promote the movie. 
there was a premiere in uh, Lawrence for the movie, and they stopped by Fort Leavenworth, and I don't know where his hand is, but nobody seems to bother too much. But I really like this, the dad's look with, uh, with the, the Hollywood star there chatting up his daughter. So we started out talking about the cavalry, and so we have to end with the cavalry. At the, out, the beginning of World War II, uh, there was a huge push to take uh, the horse cavalry to the European theater. And there were uh, initial uh, efforts made to bring the regiments together. In fact, Davison took the 10th Cavalry from Fort Leavenworth to Fort Riley and started outfitting the full regiment in expectation that they would deploy. Of course, they didn't. We didn't take any horse cavalry, although horses played a key role in World War I and World War II into the millions, but uh, not for the kind of reconnaissance and security missions. Uh, those were then taken over. I'm not sure if this was reward or punishment for this guy. <laughs> they were so close to he's grimacing or smiling. I don't know if this could end very badly, but apparently they did not this time. Who knows how many times they had to practice that. And anyway, this is what a uh, horse cavalry trooper was envisioned to look like had they gone to World War II. You see his army and his Colt 45. And I, this picture, to me, is kind of emblematic of the end of the, uh, the horse cavalry in the US. This was a, an exercise in Fort Riley around 1940. And so you can see the horses coming in from, from a training event. We had motorcycle scout car and scout cars, and then we had the horses are gonna be loaded up into trucks and taken back to the stables. And so this is kind of illustrative of why the horse cavalry never made it um, to the European theater of World War II, the demise of the horse cavalry in the United States Army. So that's, that's the end of this presentation of the legacy of the military box <laughs> And uh, when, you're, when you're concerned, uh, you know, try to blend in. Right? <laughs> so I have a couple things up here in addition to what many uh, had. I have two of the date and books that Davison um, uh, produced uh, about the Fort Leavenworth hunt, and they're very iconic, and a lot of us have used those. And there's a couple of other books that I'd like to highlight. Uh, if you're interested in the use of horses over, over history and warfare, this is a, a great, matter of fact, the author of this, Dr. DeMarco, is one of our members, and his wife, he writes. This is also a very good book. And I've got some older ones, too. And there's a recent book that came out about George, it's called Riding with George. Many of you are familiar with it. It's got a lot of really good information about George and his fox hunting exploits. And then the ghost, ghost writers is about uh, the rescuing of the lip and daughter. And I've got some other stuff out there that you're going to look at. But anyway, any questions? Actually, we're almost on time. Sir. Do you know what the criteria was to be recognized by that National Steeplechase sure. and Hunt Association? It's kind of evolved over time, but generally you had to have a, a, a pack of foxhounds, of set of hounds, um, probably around, um, I think it's probably 10 or so, 10 or 11 couple uh, of active, healthy hounds. You had to have a staff of whipper ends and uh, field masters. You had to have a master. You had to have a kennel that was properly maintained. You had to have a schedule. You had to go out so many times in the year. When you met that criteria, you would be recognized by the National Steeplechase and Hunt Association, now the MFHA. It's, just, it's very similar today. So you had to have those ingredients to be a recognized hunt. So generally what would happen is a hunt that was, that was getting established would, would, uh, would register, saying, hey, we want to be a recognized hunt. We know what the criteria is and we would, they would do it for a year or two, then um, officials from the organization would come out and inspect them and say, yay, barely, you are doing these things and you are now recognized. And it's kind of an important thing because the MFHA was originally, uh, the National Stephen Chase and Hunt Association was established to, uh, to uh, uh, mitigate uh, uh, territorial disputes amongst hunts back east there's a real large density in Virginia, Maryland, and Pennsylvania, and they were stepping on each other. And so this org they got together and established that. The other big thing that this organization does is it maintains the stud book for, for foxhounds, uh, both the American breed, crossbreds, English, and then there's another breed called Penn Marydale, 
which was created in Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Ver uh, Delaware. And they're very distinctive in their size, in their voice, and they're very popular in certain environments and terrain. So they, uh, the MFHA maintains the stud book for, for that, and you need to be a recognized member to be able to participate in that. All our hounds in the 411 Worth Hunt are registered, and when we, we draft or trade hounds, uh, those are all from the stud book from the MFHA. Second question is, what is the what is the difference, or is there a difference with the color of the uniforms? Because the huntsman was wearing red, but then other people wore red, and then he was wearing blue or black in one picture. So traditionally, uh, and this comes from England, as does the sport, and many of the customs that we follow are hundreds of years old. Uh, but where there's a lot of adaptations and deviations from that. So this stems from the staff back in England wearing the orange coat, uh, the, the scarlet or red coat, uh, in order to be able to identify and see them. And so that tradition carries over into uh, contemporary times. In most fox hunts in the US, uh, the huntsmen and the masters uh, wear a scarlet or red coat. Male members, gentlemen members of the hunt that have been awarded their colors, which is a recognition for service to the hunt, learning the sport, participating and other things can, when they get awarded the colors, each hunt, every recognized hunt, there's about 145 in North America, US and Canada today, recognize uh, hunts, um, have different uh, designations. This is the Fort Leavenworth Hunt color, collar. And there's a lot of the Mission Valley hunt, which is on the south side of Kansas City. Uh, theirs is blue with gold piping. And so there's all sorts of uh, different full run hunt is considered great, believe it or not, um, and to this day. So uh, male members uh, that have been awarded their colors at recognition of service and, and performance, etc., cetera, uh, wear the scarlet coat. And this is where it gets a little interesting. So traditionally, women do not wear the scarlet coat. However, many hunts, to include ours, when we and we we have a, a female master, uh, Gail Rue. There's a former uh, female master sitting in here, Kathy Kornacki. When she was a serving master, she wore a scarlet coat. Some hunts in the U.S. do not afford that to women huntsmen. And if a woman huntsman, we've had a female huntsman uh, at Fort Leavenworth, they would wear a scarlet coat as well as part of that tradition. Um, and then when they stopped in that service, they would not wear it. Uh, some hunts don't allow women to wear a scarlet coat under any conditions. Um, there are hunts that don't wear scarlet coats. They wear a green coat. There are hunts in the U.S. that don't wear a scarlet coat. They wear a blue coat. It's a, a kind of a, a, a royal blue-ish. Not a dark navy, but it's a royal bluish, and as opposed to scarlet. And with the banning of live hunting in England and the scourge of the saboteurs, corrupting and, and vandalizing legitimate fox hunting, a lot of hunts in England have gone away to make it difficult. Because unlike the United States, if you post your private property, you can't trespass. In England, you can go on private property as long as you don't disrupt uh, the farming operations or the livestock. You can't deny someone access to your property, so these saboteurs have access, and they, they run around and they try to mess with the hunts and stuff. And so a lot of hunts have gone away from the Scarlet Coats to make it difficult to see them. Does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. Is there, yeah, have you heard anything or is there still a hunt in Victoria, Kansas? I do not believe so. Not an organized fox hunt. I don't believe so. It was established by, I don't know, some minor royal came to Kansas because he couldn't find a job anywhere. And, and uh, of course, when a royal person come moves in and a bunch of land, uh, he, he takes up a bunch of land and then so all these other people came and he started that hunt. Well, I'm not familiar with it, but I'm going to, now you got my answer to take a look. But what you just described was a very common practice. Um, you might have two or three couple of hounds. Maybe you only had two. Maybe you only had one, but you had to send it out. And you had two or three, you had two or three, you had two or three. And you would, and you had them at home, on your farm or on your ranch, and you would get together, you'd coordinate, and you'd come and you'd bring them together and create this pack and you'd hunt for a day. That was also, uh, for those that couldn't afford to maintain a pack in colonial times, 
very, very common practice for that to happen. And that happened a lot out here. I'll say another thing is that Davis says this in his book that Custer uh, campaigned with a pack of hounds. I think that's uh, one of the couple, a number of things that Davison uh, is a little loose with. Um, I have never found any concrete reference or a picture of Custer with a pack of hounds. And if you think about it, campaigning against Indian tribes and taking a pack of hounds with you would be almost physically impossible. The logistics to, to just support the cavalry and the horses and the troopers was, was, was mind-bending. In order to maintain a pack of hounds, now what Custer did do is, I've seen pictures of him with wolf hounds, with sight hounds, one or two, and he took them with him, but you know, they probably subsisted on their own and whatever they caught, and it didn't take much. But a pack of hounds campaigning across the plains, and again, I've never seen any um, documented reference that, that, that supports that. Uh, but he was a sportsman, and he did box on Custer did. Uh, as did most of his peers. Victoria, Kansas. Now, I'm going to have to look that up. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>